Six men are shot dead while praying at a mosque in Quebec. A witness claims to have seen three gunmen, just the first of a whole bunch of reported details that turned out not to be true. The Investigators starts now. Breaking news coming to us from Canada. At least five people have been killed in a shooting inside a mosque. Witnesses described at least two or three gunmen. There almost is never a second shooter. One of those people is being treated and considered a witness rather than a suspect. He showed so much understanding for the police work, uh, for the media's work also. He said, it, it's normal, I understand. Our reporter Kurt Petrovich arrived just hours ago. Kurt, what are you seeing? field of, of body bags and uh, you could see that there were people inside and uh, they had not died well. I'm probably forever going to be associated with the idea of having had PTSD. I think it actually makes me a better journalist in some ways. I'm Diana Swain. We are The Investigators. This is what we do. One man is facing charges for that shooting at a mosque in Quebec, though initially police suspected two people and at least one witness thought there were three shooters. The confusion perhaps understandable in the panic of the moment, and it probably helps explain some of the mistakes made by journalists and police. But does it excuse them? A deadly terror attack at a mosque in Quebec, Canada. Word of the shooting quickly spread around the world. At least five people have been killed in a shooting inside a mosque. As the gravity of the attack became clear, the next questions, who did it, why, and how many of them were there? We saw three men walk in, they shot at Allah Akbar and they opened fire. Eyewitness accounts contradicted information from police that two suspects had been quickly arrested. Even the next morning, police weren't saying much about their suspects. We're not going to discuss the, the specific at this time. But that didn't stop the suspects' names from leaking out, or that one was Muslim. Several news outlets quoting police sources. Uh, able to identify them, Alexandre Bissonnette and Mohamed Kadir. Kadir was the first uh, suspect who was arrested near the mosque. Less than an hour later, though, police clarify. From the SQ, one of those people is being treated and considered a witness rather than a suspect. It turns out his name is Mohammed Belkadir, not Kadir, and police determined he was trying to escape the attack, an innocent man arrested in the chaos. Many news outlets rushed to correct the mistake. Others didn't. But was the damage to his reputation already done? La Presse reporter Vincent LaRouche was one of the first journalists to speak with Belkadir after he was released by police. Vincent, given what he'd been through, uh, how did he seem to you? Well, of course, many of us would have thought that he would have been very angry when he came home. We, we talked to him. He was really coming home. He hadn't even entered his, his house. He had just been released by the police. And you could understand if he would have been angry at the media, at the police. So we, we went uh, to him and we said, uh, it seems like you've been uh, wrongly arrested, wrongly considered a suspect, and uh, your identity has been disclosed uh, publicly. Um, do, you know, do you understand how this happened? And he, he, it, it was a surprise to me how understanding he was. He showed so much understanding for the police work, uh, for the media's work also. He said, it, it's normal, I understand. They were doing their job, they did it well, they were very nice and respectful to me, and now we've cleared uh, things up, and I'm pretty happy that I've been cleared of, of any charge, any suspicion. Let's cast back to earlier in the day. You are among a number of Canadian journalists who are going to Quebec City to cover this story. You among a whole group trying to find the names of the two suspects. You hear them on the radio and think, that's what I was trying to get. Yes, of course. Uh, well, we're, we're, all of us were rushing towards uh, Quebec City, and uh, I, we hear the names uh, of the suspects that, that leaked out to other media outlets on the radio. And of course, for the public, it doesn't make a difference. But when you're a journalist working on this kind of story, you don't want to be late on such an essential piece of information that you want to disclose to your readers, to your viewers. You want to be first, or at least you want to get it at the same time as the others. So when you're late, it's a, 
it's a frustration, of course. So uh, that's where we decided we have to separate and uh, try to find as much as we can on both of those alleged suspects that were arrested. Once the names were out and you were doing your work as a journalist, you started to have your own suspicions that perhaps he had been wrongly arrested and, and perhaps at some level accused. Yes. When I went to, uh, to Mr. Belkadir's place, the landlord came in and he said, I am 100 percent sure that he's going to be uh, declared innocent and he's going to be released by police because the police came in very early, they locked the place down, they were watching the house, uh, checking everybody who was coming in, coming out, and they said to the landlord that they needed, they were waiting for a search warrant for Mr. Belkadil's room. They were sealing the place, waiting to, to get the permission from the court to enter. And then suddenly they just left and gave back the access to the house to anybody and they obviously didn't care anymore about getting a search warrant and entering that room. So your gut started to tell you, I think he's, he's an innocent man caught up in a terrible thing. Yes, because uh, uh, it was true. All the police had left the scene. They didn't care about that house anymore, obviously, and they gave us access back to us and to everybody. So uh, that was a really clear sign that things were turning around. So that's when I called uh, the office to tell uh, my bosses and my colleagues, uh, we have to be very careful about this guy. It seems that things are starting to change. He might not be a suspect uh, anymore. Uh, and uh, one of my bosses told me that a colleague at the office had heard from a police source just a few minutes before uh, that told him, be careful with this guy. He might not be who we thought he was at first. And so thanks. Good to talk to you. All right. Thanks you. We do now want to uh, offer up uh, an image purported to be the weapon. In the Again, chaos of breaking uh, news, journalists are scrambling for pieces of the puzzle. So here's an uh, ugly uh, truth. Increasingly, journalists have to be on the lookout for people intentionally feeding false information. A county official has said the shooter had arrived on a flight from Canada. With January 6th in Fort Lauderdale, a gunman opened fire inside the airport. Like I saw him shooting. Uh, holding the gun. Witnesses described the panic and the horror of what happened right in front of them. And somebody said, shots fired, shots fired. I grabbed the kid. One man spoke to CBC and ABC News. He claimed to be picking up his son when shots were fired. Heck will will it. And he started shooting into a crowd. In fact, he wasn't there at all. He made up the story, lied to get on the air, and then bragged online about his successful con. It is very unfortunate someone would mislead people in a serious situation like this, and we deeply regret that we aired his comments. Fakers are one reason Brooke Gladstone, host and managing editor of On the Media, an American radio program, says people need to view breaking news with a critical eye. So what should you be watching for when you're watching breaking news? Brooke, so I gather you've created not just one handbook, but a whole series of them now. A, a bit of a guide for people taking in breaking news. First of all, why did you think that was needed? Well, it began for us in 2013. There was a shooter at the Washington Naval Yard. And the reports, of course, as they always are in the first couple of cycles, were completely wrong. And we talked to a couple of people, one of whom, uh, Canadian Craig Sil Silverman, who we've talked to a lot about news that's fake. And he had begun to observe a bunch of basic tendencies, a kind of arc of coverage that invariably gets things wrong until they get things right. And since then, we posted it then, and of course, there have been countless mass shootings since then. And it's been reposted and reposted many, many times and downloaded millions of times all over the world. It's been spontaneously translated because it seems that... Uh, the way we screw up the news here is pretty much how everyone screws up the news everywhere. So give me a couple of the things that are typically reported wrong in those early hours. Well, usually the number of victims, the names of the assailants, there is invariably reference to a possible second shooter 
there almost is never a second shooter. You'll find that uh, this kind of breaking story tends to bring out the, the fakers and the photoshoppers. You have to be very careful, not only what you consume, but also what you retweet. I mean, a lot of this is on you as the news consumer. So what is the takeaway? Do people just wait a couple of days before checking into the story because most of us want to know what's happening while it's happening. Yeah, I know. That is an absolutely irresistible need. And really, you don't have to wait days. Actually, you do. For our plane crash edition, we have discovered that usually the clear story doesn't come out for days, sometimes weeks. But in the case of a mass shooting, it's really just in the moment or in the very, very short after moments that things tend to be wrong. So if you just wait, if you consult sources that are closest to where the incident occurred, those tends, tend to be better. If you avoid almost anything that quotes an anonymous source, whether it's an anonymous police source or a political source or an FBI source, Anonymous sources generally indicate that people aren't standing by their impressions. Sometimes they're just trial balloons to see if they can flush someone out. And there's also certain kinds of language you need to be careful of. You know, we are looking into means they just don't have it. So don't believe it. Don't retweet it. It's really interesting insights. Thanks, Brooke. You're welcome. But reporting on suffering, disaster, and death took its toll, until finally, one story broke me. Breaking news has an impact on those of us watching the story, as well as those telling it. It became impossible to do a documentary without addressing my own PTSD. And Kurt Petrovich of CBC News is speaking out about the toll of reporting and his struggle with PTSD. Our conversation just ahead. Plus, here it is the, the space of uh, the monkey. A year-long investigation by the BBC reveals a network of animal trafficking, one of five things we learned from investigative journalism this week. Our roundup is next. But first. This may be the most transparent judicial selection process in history. Picking a Supreme Court justice is serious business, right? Well, apparently not. It's sort of like Supreme Court apprentice here. Donald Trump, the president, channeling Donald Trump, the showman. Do it and do it with gusto. And that he did, turning a solemn constitutional duty into a reality show finale. It came down to two finalists. Edge of your seat drama? You bet. CNN even ran a countdown clock to the announcement. Judges Thomas Hardiman and Neil Gorsuch were being told or be brought to Washington ahead of tonight's primetime announcement. It is possible that President Trump could change his mind ahead of this announcement. And then the big reveal. Today I am keeping another promise to the American people by nominating Judge Neil Gorsuch. And what about the runner up? Probably relieved there wouldn't be an apprentice style walk of shame and in a final reality show plot twist. But Hardiman never left Pennsylvania. He was spotted by a CNN crew at a gas station filling up his tank. Rumors of his travel to Washington, all just part of the elaborate plan to build suspense. So was the boss satisfied with the big finale? So was that a surprise, was it? Yes, Mr. President, it's been one surprise after another. Here are five things we learned this week from investigative journalists. After reporting by CBC's Go Public, TD Bank dropped a lawsuit against a 78-year-old woman who'd borrowed money to pay scam artists who were threatening to kill her family. Reuters reported that the Trump administration wants to revamp a program designed to fight extremism and change its name from countering violent extremism to countering radical Islamic extremism. A CBC Marketplace investigation found green tea extracts sold for weight loss have not been proven to be effective and in rare cases can cause liver problems. Yeah. Francois Fillon, the man who had been expected to win France's upcoming presidential election, is now fighting for his political life. 
A newspaper reported his wife collected nearly a million dollars in salary for being his parliamentary secretary, but in fact didn't actually do any work. And a year-long BBC News investigation exposed a wildlife trafficking ring in West Africa that smuggles baby chimpanzees. The research led to the rescue of a one-year-old chimp. Journalists take great care to try to be objective in their reporting, keeping their own feelings in check. But some stories, especially traumatic ones, can leave an indelible mark on the people covering them. Kurt Petrovich knows that all too well. Over a long career with CBC News, he has covered some of the biggest news stories in Canada. Police were called, and Robert Jakansky was stunned with a taser five times. Including the death of Polish immigrant Robert Jakansky at Vancouver International Airport in 2007. He's also traveled the world, reporting on natural disasters and humanitarian crises. Our reporter Kurt Petrovich arrived just hours ago at the refugee camp in Kenya. Kurt, what are you seeing? Well, thousands of would be refugees wait in the baking hot sun. Each assignment wearing down the experienced reporter. But reporting on suffering, disaster, and death took its toll until finally one story broke me. That story, Typhoon Haiyan. In 2013, Petrovich was one of the first foreign journalists to arrive in the Philippines after the storm. It had devastated parts of the country and left more than 6,000 people dead. One of the things that is difficult to remember uh, and deal with are the body bags that I saw. Petrovich's struggle with post-traumatic stress disorder is now the subject of a new documentary. The Kurt that I got home after the Philippines was a zombie. The film is deeply personal, putting someone used to telling the story in the uncomfortable role of being right in the middle of it. So why did he agree to do it? So Kurt, let's start there. What was your motivation for publicly talking about what's been a very private experience? Well, Diana, it actually kind of started out uh, a little bit differently. It started out as uh, a conversation I had with a documentary producer about doing a story about what happened to four RCMP officers in the wake of the death of Robert Jakansky at Vancouver's airport back in 2007, because by that time it had been a number of years, and they had become pariahs, and they were suffering from PTSD and a variety of other mental illnesses and difficulties. And then I was diagnosed as having PTSD myself. And so it became impossible to do a documentary without addressing my own PTSD. And as you know, I've come to learn PTSD has a way of kind of taking over your life. And so that's how that happened. And um, you know, I struggled with the idea of becoming the focus of a story myself but decided that um, if it was going to be honest, that somehow I, I had to uh, allow that kind of invasion into my own personal life and uh, to be as open about it as I could. And, and that's what happened. So I, I've had a chance to see the documentary, and you are very honest, very open about what you've been through and your attempts to try to get past it or through it, whatever the right language would be. Now that it's going to be out there, that people will see this interview, will see the documentary, other interviews that you're doing, how have you prepared yourself for people's reactions, both, both good and bad? Well, in, in some ways, it's not unlike uh, preparing for what people are going to think of a story that you've done on a controversial topic. You know, I know that there are going to be some people who uh, won't really bother <laughs> looking at the facts and the details, and we'll come to a conclusion regardless. Um, and I, you know, I, I struggle with the idea because I know that um, I'm probably forever going to be associated with the idea of having had PTSD. And some people will decide right out, out of the gate that uh, that makes me unable uh, to be a good journalist. I think it actually makes me a better journalist in some ways. Um, but, um, you know, I think uh, what holds me together is the idea that if, if I can help one person um, deal with um, having PTSD themselves, then 
I've done what it is to be a journalist, which is to shed light and to bring some kind of change and to, to help people. And I think that's what we do as journalists is, uh, what we strive to do as journalists when we tell our stories. And while it was incredibly difficult for me to accept that I was making myself the story, I satisfied myself that uh, I was upholding what I think is an actually a, a bigger part of what it means to be a journalist, and that is to um, make people's lives a little better and to shed some light. And you're right. I think you have shed some light. Really appreciate you talking to us. Thanks. No problem. Their names are Alexandra Bissonnette and Mohammed Carter. Naming names. Why the impact of being wrong is worse than ever. My POV, just ahead. There has been a lot of talk this week about the media's rush to get it first before getting it right. Let me tell you, nobody remembers who got it first, but they remember if you got it wrong. They later clarified that the second person was not a, a suspect, but was simply a witness. And the truth is, when the suspects' names were leaked by police sources, they were, in fact, still suspects. When police cleared one of the men, most news media quickly did the same. But some insisted on staying with the narrative that a Moroccan man named Mohammed had been involved in the shooting. Fox News only corrected its online tweet after being called out by no less than the prime minister's office for playing identity politics, though in reality, Fox wasn't the only one slow to make the correction. Some online still haven't done that. Now, maybe it's just laziness that has people leaving up tweets they now know are wrong. Maybe it's a bias against government or the police or the news media or Muslims that causes some people to have their own suspicions about what happened. But the facts suggest the man was a witness to a horrible crime. And it seems unspeakably cruel to let any other suggestion linger online. I'm Diana Swain. We are The Investigators.